Ian Juby, I saw him the first time watching television on Trinity. I, and I never miss Carl Ball. I have it set to record it all the time. You should never miss it. He is the best. Well, Ian Juby is one of his favorite people that he has on the show. He's on, I don't know, 10 times a year, whatever. And he's on all over the world. Every country in the world, he's on. This man is qualified and credentialed, made most of this stuff here. And some of you want to know, are they, are they real or are they replicas? I'll let him tell that later. But I'll tell you one thing. This man has it. He's a dear friend. And he's here with his father in, in grave condition with his health right now. And he loves his dad dearly, but he still came to be with us. And he might have to go back to Canada. So we welcome our Canadian friend, Ian Juby. Give him a big hand. Well, good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you. God, look at how many boys and girls we have here. Man, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, really good to see you all here. It really is. Now, do you guys mind if I take a moment to introduce myself to your parents? Is that okay? Actually, do you guys mind if the adults stay? Is that okay? Okay, cool, cool. That was nice of them, wasn't it, hey? Uh, thought I'd take just a brief moment to introduce myself because uh, not many people realize how famous I am. But uh, for you infoholics there, there's my website, ianjuby.org. And uh, as Pastor Scudder, I finally got to meet Dr. Scudder this morning uh, for the first time. I've been here a number of times, but never got to meet him. And so finally got to meet him, and he came and shook my hand on the stage. Didn't I see you on TVs? I don't know. You can't see out the other way. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, well, that's my website there. Uh, I come from the thriving metropolis of Chalk River, Ontario, Canada, right where that puny little red star is. Uh, I took a shortcut here through Ohio and Virginia because I took a wrong turn. But, uh, sorry, meant some moment. <laughs> anyway, and uh, I do a lot of stuff with the children, love doing the children's stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if they have more fun or I do. And I get that from a lot of parents. So are you single? Are you married? Do you have kids? No, I'm single. Uh, my last girlfriend broke up with me. I spent 500 bucks on her on Valentine's Day, and she called it quits. It was the best table saw the craftsman sold. I don't know what her problem was. <laughs> Thank you for getting that. I told that in Akron. They thought it was tragic. She said, oh, she left you? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm single mostly by choice. It's the women's choice, but I'm single by choice. So. Uh, I happen to be the owner of Canada's first creation museum. Uh, it's a traveling museum, and this is uh, pretty much all I have right here. Uh, I originally built it as a traveling creation museum because most people don't realize how predominantly rural Canada is. Uh, for instance, when I leave for Alberta, which is only three provinces over, I leave my house, my house, house if you're in the United States, I leave my house at four in the morning, I will drive for 19 hours. I can't drive anymore. I have to pull over and sleep for the night. I still haven't left Ontario. Uh, it's a 40-hour drive just to get to Alberta for me. And most of Canada is like that. Who's going to drive 40 hours to go to a museum, except for weirdos like me? <laughs> I don't count. Uh, so I bring the museum to the predominantly rural Canada, and I also wind up bringing it all around the United States. And as Dr. Scudder mentioned, uh, every time I'm in the U.S., Carl has me on his show. And we have a great, great time. I've, it's now been an honor, actually. Uh, I've been on his program more than any other guest, and that really is an honor to me. Uh, we really have fun. I always enjoy being in the TBN studios. Um, this is a little project I'm working on. It will hopefully be a weekly creation science show in Canada, hopefully within the next year, genesisweek.com. You'll be able to view the shows online for free. Uh, the pilots are on there. Uh, this I'm going to talk about later on in the week. This was the Big Valley Creation Science Museum. I'm curious, did anybody catch that in the news? It opened up last summer. Okay, a bit of hit and miss. It made international news, literally. This little 700 square foot building, Canada's first permanent creation museum, we were floored by the media response. Absolutely floored. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that later on. I'm also on GodTube and YouTube. My username is Wazulu. And I got all kinds of, uh, I have my uh, uh, video logs on there, a whole pile of other videos. The com original Complete Creation series was on there, and now we're re-recording those here at Quinton Road. So we'll be doing that this week. 
Um, I'm also the uh, founder of the International Creation Science Special Interest Group for Mensa members. How many people know what Mensa is? I'm curious. Wow, quite a few. Okay. Mensa is an international high IQ society. To be a member, you just have to have an IQ in the top 2% of the general population. Nothing to it. So I'm a member, and they didn't, the, the special interest groups are the heartbeat of Mensa. And there wasn't a SIG for creation science, so I started one. I asked if we could make it international because I only had one Canadian member and he was moving away. <laughs> he was moving out of the country. So they approved it. So it's now an international creation science SIG. And let me just explain to you what it means to have a genius level IQ. It means you realize you did something stupid faster than the average individual realizes it, okay? I realized when I saw the West Virginia sign that I had misread the map somewhere. I didn't think this was the right direction. See, it was genius kicking in. Okay. Anyway, there's Carl Baugh. And uh, incidentally, uh, every Tuesday, 6 o'clock local time is when it is on. Excellent program. Do get it when you get the chance. Catch it every week if you can. Uh, if you can't get it on TV, uh, I used to watch it on dial-up when I was home, and it actually worked quite well. Uh, they have streaming off the TBN website. Okay. I want to start off tonight with a pop quiz for the kids. <laughs> and you're going to be tested on this later on. Okay? You ready for this? I want you to give me your answers as fast as you can. Okay? First question. You ready? Are you ready? Well, at least somebody said okay. Okay. Oh, here we go. When did the dinosaurs live? Long time ago. How long ago? Million years ago. Ten thousand years ago. What do you think? Nine hundred eighty. Okay. Okay. Very quick. Here we go. Ready? Did dinosaurs and people ever live together? What do you think? Yes. Yes. No. No. Oh, I don't know. One side says yes. The other side says no. Okay. Oh, now they're saying yes. Okay. What happened to the dinosaurs? They died. They died? Why? A meteor. Okay. 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 Hold on a second. Here we go. Ready? You think there was cavemen? No. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. If there was cavemen, do you think they were smart? No. Okay. Okay. Where did birds come from? God. Okay. How old is the earth? Two Millions of years old. Okay, okay. Okay, that was it. Now, parents, I did that for your sake. Okay? <laughs> Hang with me here. <laughs> we'll go somewhere with that. Now, I want you guys to know that I believe my Bible. From beginning to end, from Genesis right through to Revelation, I absolutely believe it is the true and authoritative word of God. I absolutely believe it. Now, I've gotten the chance to study science for, oh, about 20 years now. I know it's a long time. I'm old. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I've become convinced every time I study this book scientifically that it is correct. Every single time. And my Bible talks about you guys. Hmm. The Bible says the invisible things of him, the creator, from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. That's you. You see, God is seen in his creation. You, his creation, see God in the creation. It's very evident. And I hope to show you that later on tonight. Anybody know who the creator is? He had his hand up pretty quick. Yeah, God, do you know his name? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. Jesus is the creator, and that is why his death and resurrection is so important. The creator came and died for us. That's why it's important. Okay, now, I want to throw a couple things out for you here. We're going to first of all talk about what science is, okay? And there's some pretty big words, okay? It's the study of the world around us, and it is based on, you ready for this? Yeah. Observation. Now, this is what I mean by that. If I take a flask and I have two chemicals, and I mix those two chemicals together and it blows up in my face, that's an observation. I observed it blowing up in my face. Okay? Okay. Now, it has to be repeatable for it to be science. Okay? So then I call up, hey bud, <laughs> mix these two chemicals together, tell me what happens. 
okay? So he mixes the two chemicals together. It blows up in his face. We just repeated the results. Do you see what I'm getting at here? It's repeatable, okay? And it has to be predictable. So Bud and I call up Joseph. <laughs> hey, Joseph, mix these two chemicals together. We can predict that it's going to blow up in his face. So we stand back and put our safety glasses on. Okay? That's science. It's observable, repeatable, and predictable. Now, there's going to be a test on that later on. Okay? Now, anybody know what this story is? Huh? Frog prince. Yes. The princess kisses the frog and poof, turns into a prince, right? No. Do you think a frog can turn into a prince? You don't think a frog can turn into a prince? No. Possible. Even if you got like the magic wand and stuff? No. Hmm. What if a scientist told you a frog could turn into a prince? No. Would you believe them? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you believe them. Okay. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I got a little surprise for you. I know a whole pile of scientists who say that the Bible is not true, there is no God, and frogs turned into princes. No. I agree, no. <laughs> In fact, there's a scientific and natural law. Are we ready for this? This is a big word. There is a scientific and natural law that says it is impossible for a frog to turn into a prince. It's called the law of biogenesis. Can you say that, biogenesis? biogenesis. Hey, I'm impressed. Man, I didn't even have to lead you guys through that. Okay. Okay, so the law of biogenesis says it's impossible for frogs to turn into princes. Now, my Bible says that you guys can tell the creation has been created, and you, the creation, can recognize the creator. This is a nifty little gadget. It's called the Baghdad battery. It was found in Iraq, and it's got an iron rod, a copper tube, it's got asphalt on the top, a little wire coming out, and it's all in a, a clay vase. You put acid in it, and it makes electricity. It's a battery. Do you guys think that battery had a creator, or do you think it formed by itself? Oh, well, someone's determined it formed by itself. <laughs> a creator, right? You can recognize someone made it. What about that? Does that create it? Yeah, okay. What about that? Did that have a creator? Yes. yes. What about that? Did it have a creator? Okay. Anybody know what that is? A motor. A motor. That's right. Now, look very carefully. This motor has several parts. It's an electric motor. It has the rotor. It's called that because it rotates. Then you have the stator. It's called that because it stays there. <laughs> then you have the drive shaft which goes through the bushing or bearing, which holds the whole thing centered so it can rotate. Now, you guys know that had a creator, right? Okay, now, I'm hoping you kids over there can see this, but if you can't, make sure you come out over here later on and make sure that you push a button before you leave, okay? So if you're under 13, if you're 13 and under, you have to push a button before you leave, okay? So my age or younger, okay? Okay, I think this is the right one. Okay, this is a nifty little creature that is right now swimming around in your intestine. Ew. <laughs> it's called a bacteria. And specifically, E. coli. Now, E. coli bacteria have this tail that it spins. And that's how it swims. Now, because it spins its tail, the tail takes on a corkscrew shape. And it spins it, get this, up to 100,000 times every minute. Give you a quick comparison. The F-15 jet fighter, one of the most advanced jet fighters in the world, its engines only spool out at about 45,000 turns every minute. This outstrips it two to one. This bacteria can swim 15 body lengths in one second. So in other words, if you were to keep up, you'd have to swim from about here to those stands in one second. Anybody want to try? Don't, you'll hurt yourself. <laughs> Just trust me on this, okay? Now, the Japanese especially are really paying attention to this because what they're doing is they are dissecting it and trying to figure out how it works because they want to copy it. 
They want to make robots so small based on this technology that they can put it into a needle and inject it into your blood vessels and have it do surgery on the inside of your body without even cutting you open. That's pretty impressive. So what they're doing is they're cutting it in half to see what they can see. And when they take a look inside, this is what they see. It is essentially an electric motor. It has all the parts of an electric motor. The rotor, called that because it rotates. The stator, called that because it stays there. The drive shaft, which runs through the bushing or bearing, which holds the whole thing centered. And then finally, spinning the tail in what many have called a universal joint. Now you guys think this had a creator, this model, right? What about the bacteria? No. It's as complex. No. Complexity implies it was created. Let me ask it another way. Can this battery, or can this bacteria, assemble itself without a guided, intelligent creator? Because no. it just fall together? No. It has to have a creator. See, and you guys are just kids. You even know that. Now, here's the catch. Now, if you girls, if you have long hair, you can do this. Boys, don't pull your hair out, because then this happens, OK? <laughs> so, but if you have long hair, pull a hair around and look at the very tip of your hair. Or maybe you can borrow your friend's hair. <laughs> OK, just don't pull it out. <laughs> this motor is so small, you can fit 8 million of these motors on the tip of one of your hairs. Whoever this creator is, is a pretty amazing creator. And it demands a creator. OK, I'm going to do something I normally don't do. OK, anybody know what that is? Egg, egg from ostrich egg. You got it. Pretty big egg, huh? OK. I'm going to do something that I normally never do. This is an actual fossil dinosaur egg. This is not a cast. It's the real McCoy. This is a hadrosaur egg. And I'm going to talk about the hadrosaurs later on, that big one down there. That is a hadrosaur, a full-grown one. Oh, that's OK. I'm, oh, wait for it. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pass this around. OK? So you can actually hold a dinosaur egg. How many museums can let you pet their dinosaur egg? Not many, eh? OK. No, it's not alive. It's very dead. <laughs> it's very dead. It's very fossilized. So this is an actual fossil hadrosaur egg. I want you to do a couple things, though. Pass it around carefully. Don't hold it above your head, because then you drop it on someone else's head, and they get mad at you, OK? So carefully hold it, and pass it around so everybody gets a chance to hold it. And don't put it in your pocket and walk out the door with it, OK? So be very careful with it. I'm going to pass it around. I'll start down here. Ah, uh, this is what I'll keep. It's nowhere near as much fun as the dinosaur egg. Yep, and it is heavy, by the way. Don't forget, it is a rock. Now, dinosaur eggs tell a very interesting story. And I'm going to use this cast of that dinosaur egg to explain it. I mean, some people have tried to say that there was no past global flood. Now, you guys remember the story of Noah and the Ark in the Bible? Yeah? yeah? OK. It's a really big flood, and this guy by the name of Noah built a really big boat. Do you guys think maybe Noah brought dinosaurs on the Ark? No? no? Mm. They would eat them? Oh, that's a problem, isn't it? Oh. OK, OK. Now, first of all, a lot of people say Noah couldn't have brought dinosaurs on the Ark. They're too big. I mean, Brachiosaurus, <laughs> Brachiosaurus was huge. He was like 80 feet long from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. If you were Noah, now, my Bible says God instructed Noah to bring two of every land animal. Are dinosaurs land animals? Hmm. So Noah's supposed to bring dinosaurs with him. What would you do if you were Noah? Hmm. Well, that's a problem. Have any of you gotten the chance to clean out a barn recently? Oh, you did? Lucky you. Was it fun? Oh, you didn't enjoy it. Okay, good. <laughs> it was fun, right? Can you imagine cleaning out after a barn full of dinosaurs? Ugh. It says we can, I 
But if I was Noah, you know what I would do? Ah, here's what I would do. I would bring baby dinosaurs on the ark. Think about it for a second. Here's, how the, here's the size they were when they're born. Okay. Here's the size of a full-grown one. Look at the difference in size. This was just its head. Look at how big they grow. So I, if I were Noah, I would bring the baby dinosaurs on the ark because they sleep lots, they don't eat much, don't take a lot of space, don't go to the bathroom much, that's important. And when they get off the ark, they have a full life ahead of them, right? So now, there is a problem. Noah only brought a few dinosaurs on the ark. He didn't bring all of them. Now, my Bible, where's my Bible? There's my Bible. My Bible says that the floodwaters rose for 150 days. That's five months. Shh, careful now. That's five months. If you were a dinosaur, wouldn't you have to lay eggs in five months? No. No. <laughs> Most dinosaurs would. And when you gotta go, you gotta go. So whether there's a raging flood going on or not, the dinosaurs have to do something about their eggs because the water is continually rising until the highest land is covered and the dinosaurs can no longer roam. So here's what they did. Now this is a reconstruction of a, an oviraptor egg nest. Now the oviraptor egg nest, actually I'm gonna pull this off and hold it up for everybody so you can see. The oviraptor eggs, or the oviraptor, uh, it's very interesting how it got its name. It's called egg stealer or egg robber. Here's why. When they first found an oviraptor, they found it with a dinosaur egg nest. And they thought that the dinosaur was stealing the eggs. And so that's why they called it egg robber, ova raptor. Now later on, they found the same eggs as these, only it had a baby dinosaur inside the egg. Guess what kind of dinosaur it was? Oviraptor. It wasn't stealing its eggs. It was a mother sitting on the nest, protecting its eggs from the flood. That's most likely what it was. Now here's what the oviraptor wants to do. And by the way, later on they found a couple of oviraptors actually buried alive sitting on the nest. That was a pretty fast flood. Now here's what the oviraptor wants to do when it lays its nest. It stands in the middle and apparently it laid two eggs at a time. So you see how the eggs are in pairs? And so what it would do is it would stand in the middle and lay them. It would lay two eggs, rotate, lay two eggs, rotate, lay two eggs. And it would do that in a circle and then make a second level. And then it would sit on the nest much like a bird sits on its nest. Now that's what the oviraptors wanted to do. But here's the thing, when we find dinosaur egg nests, we usually don't find them like this. We usually find them in piles, or in this case, we actually found this egg nest. If you look carefully, the eggs actually rise as they go around the circle. Apparently, as the dinosaur was laying its egg nest, the mud it was laying them in was actually going up, it was actually rising. Again, it's evidence of a flood. This dinosaur here was another oviraptor. Almost looked like this oviraptor was laying its eggs on the run. Why would it do that? I wonder what on earth it was running from. Maybe it was Noah's flood. Maybe. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you something here. It's a little complicated, but I think you guys are smart enough to handle it. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk to you about information. And it's really difficult to grasp at first. Information can be communicated in a bunch of different ways. For instance, it can be communicated on a scroll or in a telephone book. A telephone book has a lot of information, right? Okay. Or sometimes the information can be in a book and the information is something like Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. That's information, right? I didn't know Mary had a little lamb. Well, maybe you did. <laughs> Sometimes the information is in, for instance, a dictionary. There's a whole pile of words with a whole pile of information in there. Where did the information in that book come from? Hmm. God? Maybe ultimately. Yep. A printer or the writer of the book? 
Did the information come from the book? No, it came from the person who wrote the book, right? Okay, okay. So, sometimes, do you guys have those walkie-talkies with the button, and you can do Morse code? Beep, 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 beep. You have one? Okay, excellent. <laughs> That's Morse code. So you are communicating information using sound. Just using dots and dashes. Three dots, three dashes, three dots means SOS for save our souls. Morse code. Information can be communicated by sound. The internet is primarily transmitting information by light. So if you can understand what we're getting at here, information is communicated. It comes from a person and is sent to another person. Okay? Now, do these letters contain any information? No? Okay, let me ask you again here. Do these letters contain any information? Yes. What changed? The dead letters. Oh, so the information isn't in the letters. The information came from someone who put the letters in the sequence, right? Yeah. Now, the other way around, if we take those letters and we add more letters, or we take that information and we add more letters, do we get more information? Yeah. No. no, we actually lose what we already had, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So the information is not in the letters, the information comes from outside of the letters. Now, now it's going to get really complicated. <laughs> you guys want to impress your parents tonight? Yeah. Go home and say you learned about deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay? You can say it for short. We learned about DNA. Have you heard that term before? Some of you have? You haven't? Okay. Now, I have a model of DNA right here. This is a strand of stuff that is in every single one of your cells. And this is a series of letters all put together. You know what this is? This is a blueprint on how to build you. Or a plant or a fish, or whatever the genetic code happens to be in. It's a, a secret code, if you will. A secret code on how to build you. And it's made up of four letters, G, C, T, and A. So again, if you want to impress your parents, you can say yeah, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine. There'll be a test on this later, especially for you. <laughs> now, all these letters get put together in a sequence and it's information on how to build you. Now, you guys told me the information in a book came from the author, right? Where did the information in the DNA, in the instructions on how to build you, where did the information come from? Had to have. It didn't come from the DNA. If you just put a bunch of letters together, you don't have instructions. You don't have information. Someone has to put the letters together. And I would say, God did. And he assembles them together, end to end, just like that. You know how many letters are in your instruction set? 3.2 billion letters. That's a lot of information. Okay, what do we got next here? Oh, yes. My Bible talks about the days of creation. Now, my Bible says that God created the world in six days. Now, I asked you guys at the beginning if you thought dinosaurs and humans lived together. Now, let's take a look at what the Bible says for a second. Day one, God created earth, space, time, and light. Day two, he created the atmosphere. Day three, he created dry land and plants. Day four, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five, oh, now it gets interesting. He created the sea and flying creatures. This is day five. Okay, this is, anybody know what kind of dinosaur this is? Uh-huh. No, no, good guess, though. A lot of people think that. Anybody know? Mm-hmm. No, no, not that one either. Uh, oh, you're close. Real close. Okay. You probably won't know. This is a mosasaur. And it looked a lot like an alligator, only it had flippers instead of legs. So it was a marine dinosaur. What day did God create the marine dinosaurs on? Uh-huh. Day five. Because that's when he created the sea and flying creatures. That's also when he created the pterodactyls. 
Now, what most people don't realize, this is actually the size of most pterodactyls. Most pterodactyls only have a wingspan about the length of a ruler. Most of them are quite small. When did God create the flying pterodactyls? Mm -hmm. On the fifth day. Okay, now day six, now it gets really interesting. God creates people and the land animals. Is the hadrosaur a land animal? No. No? Yeah. <laughs> well, so far as we know it was. <laughs> of course. So, according to the Bible, people and dinosaurs were created on day six. So they lived together, according to the Bible. Now, is that really the case? Let's take a look and see what the scientific evidence says. 41. You guys ever read the book of Job? Yeah. yeah. You have? Okay. Well, when you get the chance, read the book of Job, chapter 40 and 41. It talks about two creatures called Behemoth and Leviathan. Now, let's take a look at what the description says of those strange creatures. Remember, this is after the flood. Okay? So remember, it says it ate grass like an ox. It had very strong, big belly muscles, just like me. That's muscle. It had a tail like a cedar. Like a cedar tree? That's strange. It had bones like bronze and iron. And it could drink a whole river. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you guys maybe think this was an elephant? No? Let's take a look. Elephants don't have a tail like a cedar tree. Maybe it was a hippopotamus. Do you think it was our, or a rhinoceros? What about a rhinoceros? Mm. Rhinoceroses don't have a tail like a cedar tree. Yeah. Maybe it was a hippopotamus. They have big, strong belly muscles, right? Okay. A hippopotamus doesn't have a tail like a cedar tree either. There's only one thing left that it could be. What has a tail like a cedar tree? The dinosaurs. T-Rex, Brachiosaurus, all the dinosaurs, Hadrosaurus, Stegosaurus. Now, let me show you something real quick. I almost forgot about this. We were talking about the hadrosaurs. They're a land animal. But what I didn't show you is, is why they call them a duck-billed dinosaur. And it has to do with the duck bill. They have what sure looks like the bill of a duck on his front. So this is a small hadrosaur. Again, it's a land animal. This was a plant eater, most likely. And the interesting thing about that hadrosaur down there is it has what looks like T-Rex tooth bite marks all over it. Now, I don't think T-Rex was a meat eater. Maybe it was, but I don't think it was. I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. Did you guys see this yet? No. You see, it looks like a duck. It looks like a duck bill, doesn't it? That's why they call it a duck billed dinosaur. Okay. <laughs> This is a hadrosaur. Uh, there isn't anything dangerous about them. Although I always talk about them as my big, vicious pet duck. But that's just me. <laughs> now, anybody know which dinosaur that is? T-Rex. T-Rex. Oh, yes. Everybody knows what T-Rex is. Now, I happen to have a cast of a tooth from T-Rex. Do you guys think T-Rex ate meat? You know? Okay. Well, you know, my Bible, my Bible says that in the beginning, everything ate plants, and that was it. There was no meat eaters. So what about T-Rex? I was told it was a meat eater. Well, let's look at that scientifically. First of all, here's its tooth, but its tooth only goes into the gums this far. What's going to happen if it bites another dinosaur? It's going to rip its own teeth out. And dinosaur dentists were rare. I don't know about you guys. I wouldn't want the profession of a dinosaur dentist. That sounds dangerous to me. But even more interesting is when you take a close look at the teeth. Right there. You see that edge? It's razor sharp. It actually has serrations. Like a, a serrated knife. But that's not for meat. That's for canes and stalks and grasses. What about those little arms it's got up front? What are those good for? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> exactly. Amen. 
They're not good for anything. I figure, you know what it's good for, I figure? Holding toothpicks. I figure that's about all it's good for. Its arms aren't much bigger than yours, yet we're told it did things like rip other dinosaurs apart. Can you rip a dinosaur apart with your arms? No. There doesn't seem to be anything meat-eater-like about the T-Rex. My Bible says, uh, well, <laughs> if it had a knife, maybe. <laughs> well, my Bible says they ate plants in the beginning. The evidence seems to line up with that. Anybody know what that's a skull of? Mm -hmm. T-Rex. Oh, good guess, though. <laughs> it's, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let me ask you another question first. Do you guys think that's a meat eater? No. No? But well, look at those big, sharp, pointy teeth. Doesn't it look big and vicious? Well, the T-Rex had big, shiny, tar sharp, meat, uh, sharp teeth like that. It was a meat eater, wasn't it? Yes. Okay, okay. Now, you seem to think you knew what it was. You know what that skull is? Yeah. You're close. It looks like a dog, doesn't it? It's not, though. You know what it is? It's a fruit bat. What do fruit bats eat? How do we know? It, we can observe them eating fruit, fruit, right? Ah, that's good science. Has anybody seen a T-Rex lately? That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> so we don't have a T-Rex around to observe what it eats, do we? So we really don't know what it eats, just looking at its teeth, do we? We can't tell. Okay, what do I got next? Oh, yes, okay, you guys want to go on a dinosaur dig? Okay, let's go on a dinosaur dig. The dinosaurs tell a very interesting story, and there's a lot to be learned from the dinosaurs. Now, this is a dig site up in northwest Colorado. My good friend Carl Baugh brings a team up there every year. I've gone a couple of times now. And to give you a size for scale, there's a truck, and there's the dig site way up there on the hill. Okay, so let's take a closer look. There's my good friend, Joe Taylor. He even looks like a paleontologist. He's got a beard like down to here. Really cool guy. And he digs dinosaurs for a living. Now, you see all this plastic and all those flags? Yeah. Every single one of those, dinosaur bone. Where we were digging, there was anywhere from 3 to 30 bones per every square yard. It's a lot of dinosaur bones. For instance, here Jordan is working on a dinosaur bone the size of my leg, one leg bone, and it was the size of my leg. This is bone, this was a big flat platy bone, 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 uh, bone, 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 another chunk of bone, another chunk of bone. And what we do is we dig around them. When you're out in the field, you try not to dig up the bones, you try and dig around them, find the edges, then we pack it in tin foil, just like this, and then we pack it in what we call a plaster jacket. Have any of you broken a bone, like your arm or your leg? Quite a few, okay. You know that cast they put on your arm? Same stuff. Pretty tough stuff, isn't it? Okay, so we wrap it all in this plaster jacket, we rip it out of the ground. Here we are, we've got this one prepped, just about ready to pull out, it's a big chunk. Probably weighed about five, six hundred pounds. And we roll it out, and then we fill all that in with plaster, and then we take it on a trailer to the lab. And that's where we open it up, and that's where we look at the dinosaur bones. The reason we do that is because when you're out in the field, if you drop a bone fragment, you may never find it again. But if you're running a good lab, you keep the floors swept and clean, and you can find the pieces you drop or any mistakes you make. Now, there it is, ready to go. So we're going to now drag that down the hill, put it on a trailer, take it back to the lab. This is 100 miles away in Utah, 100 miles away. That's a long way away. This is Dinosaur National Monument. Now, unfortunately, I'd say you should go and visit it, but two weeks after I took these pictures, they closed it down. And it's going to be closed until they fix that building, because the building's falling apart, unfortunately. So if they open it up again, go see it, because when you go inside, you see nothing but dinosaur bones. Tons and tons and tons of dinosaur bones. Now, you notice all the dinosaurs were ripped apart? I wonder what happened to them. A flood? A meteor. A meteor, okay. I'll give you a big hint. 
Here's a major clue as to what happened to these poor dinosaurs. If I can find them. There they are. Do you know what the most common fossil there is? A rat. Nope. It's not dinosaur bones. It is fossil clams. Where do clams live? In the water. In the water? Do you think dinosaurs and clams live together? Yes. No, not likely, huh? But if they were buried in a flood, ripped apart had all their limbs and bodies ripped apart, it would make sense that they were buried together with clams, wouldn't it? And these are clams that were buried in the closed position. They were buried alive. And there's tons of them. Okay, I'm going to pass these ones around too. Who's got my dinosaur egg? Okay, okay. I don't want anybody walking out with that. I'm paranoid. Okay, I'm going to pass this around here, okay? So make sure everybody gets a chance to see it. Now... When we find dinosaurs, they're usually found in two ways. They're either ripped apart, like we saw, and if you go to the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta, which is a really cool museum, you've got to visit it, they try and explain it like this. This was a huge flood that happened in Quebec, not far from my house. And you see all those animals that were buried together in the river? That makes sense. Sure, they were just buried together. However, here's the thing. That is a small river. This is a map of that formation we saw those dinosaur bones in. This was no small river. This was a giant flood. Gargantuan flood. Now, when we find dinosaurs, we either find them ripped apart or we find them in what we call the death pose. Now what I have here, anybody know the name of this fossil by chance? Uh, no, not many dinosaur. I'm usually surprised. Someone usually knows. Does anybody know the name of that fossil? Oh, it's not a lizard. You want to try? Uh, no, not a tiny dinosaur. <laughs> Good guess, though. Oh, okay. Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> Good guess, though. This is what we call Archaeopteryx. And it's probably the most famous fossil ever found. Here's why. And I'll show the kids this. You'll notice it has feathers and wings, but when you take a close look at the wingtips, you'll see that it has claws on the wingtips. Can you guys see that? <laughs> I'll hold it a little higher, see if you can see it. And here's the real surprise. If you look real close in his beak, you'll see little tiny teeth. Can you see I see that? It's really hard to see. They're small. Now here's what happened. Those scientists who say a frog turned into a prince, they say this was a bird turning into a lizard. That's what they believe. And they point to the claws and they say, see, that's like a lizard. Lizards have claws and lizards also have teeth. Therefore, it must be half bird, half lizard. So it must be a bird turning into a lizard. However, today there are birds with claws on the wingtips just like this one. And you've even heard of them. The ostrich is one. The hoatzin is another. And down in South America, there's a little hummingbird about this big. Guess what it has in its beak? Yep. <laughs> Actually, 52 to be precise. But yes, good guess. <laughs> it has teeth. And you know what? After 15 years of study, we still don't know what they use their teeth for. Yep. There you go. Now, the story doesn't end there. You guys will please notice it's the size of a chicken. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so it's about the size of a chicken, but you'll notice it's no longer the thickness of a chicken. You guys see that? It's now the thickness of a chicken burger. What happened to poor Archaeopteryx? Do you think it got buried before or after it turned to a rock? Really tough question. After. After. Oh. Before, let me ask another question. Has any of you tried to squish a rock? One, excellent, so I'm not the only one. Did it work? No, well, what happened? It like shattered, exploded and stuff? It didn't work, eh? Well, okay. Well, I tried with a hammer and stuff, it doesn't work. Observation, good science, see? Now. So that tells us this bird was squished before it became a rock. Now I have an experiment for you. Do any of you guys have a sandbox? Excellent. 
Okay, now you've got to do this with your parents' permission. And if you do this experiment, please write to me and tell me what your results are, okay? What I want you to do is get your parents to go to the store and buy a chicken, place it in your sandbox, put sand on top of it, and keep adding sand, more and more sand, until you have so much sand that it squishes your chicken that thin. Okay? Then I want you to measure the height of the sand and tell me how much sand it took. Can you guys do that? No? <laughs> no, no, a dead chicken. Dead chicken. Don't do it with a live chicken. No, this is... Dead chicken. Dead chickens are cheaper, too. So, okay. So the point is this. This chicken was buried under an enormous mountain of dirt like that. Real fast. Now, the story doesn't end there. Notice its head is arched back as far as it can go. Can you guys see that? Okay. There's its head arched back as far as it can go. This is what we call the death pose. You want to see? There you go. This is what we call the death pose. And it's not just Archaeopteryx. We also see it with the dinosaurs. In fact, to say that it's common is an understatement. Check this out. This is my friend Vance Nelson's uh, museum in Canada. This is the Creation Museum, in, or the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. Museum of Nature in Ottawa. Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. Royal Terrell Museum, that's a bird. Well, no, sorry, that's Compson Nathan's, that's a small one. Royal Terrell Museum. Fossil Butte National Monument in Wyoming. That's a bird. And that's a bird. <laughs> now, what is that? Ostrich, yeah, you got it. Right, okay. Now, the reason I went to an ostrich ranch is because I was told that when an ostrich dies, its head falls back, just like that. And so I went to the ostrich ranch and I said, hey, I'm doing a study on the fossil record and the death pose in the fossil record. And I was told that the ostriches, when they die, their heads fall back. Is that true? And the lady said, you know what she said to me? She said, oh yes. In fact, we can tell when an ostrich chick is sick because as it's sitting there, its head will nod back. However, when it dies, its head will flop to the side, its legs will flop to the side. You'll find it at any position. I am convinced these dinosaurs and Archaeopteryx and the bird were buried alive and they pulled their necks back as they were gasping for air because they were buried alive. Ooh. You follow what I'm saying there? Is it's not just the dinosaurs. Get this. Sometimes it's marine animals. There's a, a coelophyte, uh, not coelophyte, it's a kichasaurus. I have another one over there. You can see it for yourself later on. Now, what about the fossils? Okay, my Bible says... Ten times in the first chapter of Genesis, it says that God created everything to reproduce after its kind. The scientists who say frogs turned into princes say that things change over time. After all, a frog turned into a prince, right? That's a lot of change, right? Okay, let's look at this scientifically. Do any of you know what that fossil is? Fish? What kind of fish? Swordfish? No, you're close. It's not a swordfish. It's a garfish. How do we know that it's a garfish? Its nose? Or, more importantly, it looks like a garfish. They're still alive today. That's how we know what they look like. They're still alive today. So nothing has changed. Now, what about this? What is that? Dragonfly? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How? Okay. Okay. Shh, shh, okay. How do you know it's a dragonfly? Because it looks like a dragonfly. Yeah. Okay. This is supposed to be 100 million years old. I don't believe that date. But the scientists who say a frog turned into a prince, that's how old they say it is. They say it's 100 million years old. 100 million years, dragonflies have turned into dragonflies. Hmm. Anybody know what that is? Horseshoe crab. 
How do we know it's a horseshoe crab? Ice cream. Ice cream? <laughs> uh, we're losing them. Okay, hold on a second. How do we know it's a horseshoe crab? Because it looks like a horseshoe crab. A hundred million years old, nothing has changed. Here's one of my more favorite ones. It's a shrimp. How do you know? It looks like one. <laughs> nothing has changed. This is a fossil ammonite. It is supposed to be 300 million years old, according to the scientists who say a frog turned into a prince. Here's the modern version, the Nautilus. Here is what 300 million years of evolution has accomplished. Absolutely nothing. Instead, things have faithfully reproduced after their kind, exactly like my Bible said they would. So which is correct? Things change over time or things stay the same over time? They stay the same. So scientifically, which is correct? Frogs turned into princes? Or things were created and stayed the same way all the time? Which one does the evidence support? The Bible. Things were created. Okay, I'm going to call that it for tonight. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass things back over to Dr. Scudder. And thank you so much for having me out here tonight. So I'll have questions for you later on. I know this a lot for some of you because you've been taught it all your life. But if there were really evolution, there'd be more intermediaries than terminals. And you couldn't go out your door because you'd be falling over all the stages. A half eyeball, a half foot, a half leg, a half hair. Well, some of you could prove that, but anyway, uh, it, just, it just doesn't work. You know, they say we got our eyes from a light-sensitive spot. Boy, that's not really true. That's a freckle. You know, aren't you glad they're right here? If you got them from your freckles, every time you sit down, you go blind. It doesn't make sense except a creator. And thousands of scientists are not evolutionists. Yes, the majority are. But there's thousands and are. Even some of the evolutionists are saying now that evolution couldn't have happened, but they know God couldn't have happened either. Well, God did happen. I'm going to take five minutes because there's something very important to all of us here, and that's, what, and that's where you spend eternity. You know, you can believe all the stuff, and you can be a creationist, but if you don't know how to go to heaven, God says, I love you, but I hate your sin. This hand right here represents Christ. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ. See, Christ paid my sin debt on the cross. He paid it all. And now we can go to heaven because of Christ. Now, some of you, if you believed in evolution, Christ was just a made over ape. Right? See, remember this, and, and, and Dr. Juby's already said this. But evolution is atheism. Now, I know it doesn't say it in the books in high school or even in college. But when I finally decided to find out for myself, I went and checked out the books out of the library. And here's what one of them said. It said, of course, if there's a God, he could do the creation in six days. If there's a God, he could do the creation in six seconds. Because if there's a God, he's unlimited. And it hit me. Evolution, in its true sense, is atheism. Now, most of you don't believe in atheism. Most of you believe in God. Why? Because it makes sense. Because there has to be a creator. Well, if you believe in, in creation, then Jesus Christ makes a lot more sense. When Darwin was buried in Westminster Abbey, the church accepted Darwinism. I couldn't believe when I went to Westminster Abbey and I stood on Darwin. I'll have to admit I did this. That's right. I promise you this, Darwin doesn't believe in evolution now. The minute he died, he didn't. 
And here we are with our sin. How do we get rid of it? Well, I'll go to church. No, you believe that Christ paid your sin debt and he paid for it. You don't have to. Isn't that great news? Okay, let's all bow our heads and I'm not going to embarrass anybody. We're, over, we're out of here in about one minute. Our Father, if there's some here tonight that don't know you as Savior, I'm going to ask right now, and I'm, I'm not going to have them raise their hand or do anything, but if they'll just right now say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and Christ paid my sin debt and died on the cross, paid all of my sins, and Lord, I don't believe we came from monkeys or anything else. I believe we were created, and I want to put my trust in you right now.